Great. So before I get started, I just want to ask you guys a question, and I'm not really looking for direct answers, but if you want to put something in chat, that's fine. Uh, is this the best way to release software? Right? That's a box of pizza boxes and Diet Coke on a conference room table late at night. I've done this more than once. Uh, I can remember when we didn't just have release nights, but we had release weeks. Uh, 25 years ago, I was building box software with boxes and docs and, and you know, just a lot of drama and a lot of craziness, right? And it was because things are going to go wrong, right? And um, I don't think that's the right way to release software anymore. And, and that's why I want to give this talk tonight uh, on progressive delivery and really, first of all, demystifying progressive delivery, but also going a little deeper to help people understand to tease out what the sort of value add layers on top of the, of the fundamental practice are, right? So that's what I'm gonna cover tonight is what I call a layered approach to progressive delivery. Uh, and we'll start by just defining progressive delivery to make sure everybody's kind of on the same page. We'll give two examples uh, in the wild of, of firms that have been doing this for a while, and then we'll build it up. We'll start with the foundation layer, which is to couple and deploy from release, and then the upper layers, which is really the essence of my talk tonight is how do we automate data-driven feedback to make releases, frankly, more boring and more routine and more informative, a better feedback loop for us. So let's jump right into defining progressive delivery. I'm gonna take a definition from, Carlo, from Carlos Sanchez, who last time I checked was a senior compiler engineer at Adobe. Um, and this is what he said, I'll build it up a little bit at a time. So progressive delivery is the next step after continuous delivery where new versions are deployed to a subset of users. And, and hang on to that thought, subset of users is really important here and are evaluated in terms of correctness and performance. So we're not talking about rough testing, basic QA, we're talking about do they really do what they were intended to do and are they performant in production before rolling them out to the totality of users. So this is, if you've heard of a canary release or, or you know, this is basically how do I get some feedback before I affect all my users and roll it back if it's not matching some key metrics. So this is uh, one fairly concise definition of what is progressive delivery. But I think it's important to think about where did this term come from? So the, the actual origin story here is, has, has connections to England, um, which was uh, a guy named Sam Guckenheimer, who's now retired, but was head of Azure DevOps at, at Microsoft, was having a conversation with James Governor, who goes by the handle Monk Chips on Twitter. And this is what Sam had to say to James. He said, well, when we're rolling out services, what we do is progressive experimentation because what really matters is the blast radius. How many people will be affected when we roll out that service and what can we learn from them? And I think what's really important about this is that a lot of people have learned that progressive delivery is this notion of gradually releasing something. But, if, but you gotta get, get back to the roots of why was Sam doing that at Microsoft? They wanted to do that to limit the blast radius, yes, but also to learn from the earliest stages of the rollout rather than waiting until they've given it to everybody before they figure out what they have on their hands. So um, Monk Chips takes this and he says, you know, aha, I think there's this term we could, we could use for, for a more sort of generalized basket of skills and technologies to concern with this way of making software and getting it out. How do we deploy it, right? Um, and he came up with this term progressive delivery. Uh, and that's where the term became kind of it began to become a common thing to talk about, and that was in 2018, but the practice didn't start in 2018. It actually started a long time before that. So let's look at a couple examples that have been going on much longer before the, the name progressive delivery. The first one is a system that walmart.com uh, built called Expo. And if you look at the top left there, their primary reasons for the system are twofold. And I wanna start with the one that kind of is most specific to really what we're talking about tonight, which is called test to launch. Basically, during a rollout, they wanted to be able to gradually roll it out and to observe in real time how it's going, both on a technical side and on a user behavior side, before they roll it all the way out. And we're not talking about you know, a week at a time. This could be over hours. Um, but the point is that they, they, they built a very high performance uh, data infrastructure to be able to digest in real time how the system and the users are behaving as they roll out their changes. On the left, there's test to learn, which is, where they actually are deliberately conducting an experiment to figure out, well, if we do this, will users really understand it? Will they do what we think they'll do? And then I, I, I'd include some other screenshots. These are from blog posts. And when I share the deck, which I'll do after uh, the other Dave finishes his talk, you can see the links to get to, to the blog posts that I pulled this from. 
The other example I wanted to show was LinkedIn, which is, it's had a couple of names. This is uh, Lick's LinkedIn experimentation platform. But they, they if you look on the left, that's the, the members coming in to make a page request. And then the back end services are basically asking if they should be part of some sort of a, of a partial exposure or an A-B test. And they get served their experience. On the right is something I really want everybody to take to heart. On the right, it says, this failed on site speed. And what it's saying is that for the users that are being exposed to this new way the code is being deployed, there's a significantly higher latency, right? And so the, the system is automatically checking for this all the time. The, the development team doesn't have to go poking around and looking to see is everything OK. They're literally getting notified that, hey, by the way, as you're rolling this out, people who get this experience have a much higher uh, site speed score, right? So that's something uh, called a guardrail metric, and we'll get back to that in a minute. I just wanted to give you these two examples. And these are kind of a high bar that's been set here because they built some very elaborate systems. I want to take a second before I move on and just talk about, I gave a talk uh, probably a year ago or more now called uh, you know, Shades of Progressive Delivery. And I, I think most of you are familiar with probably with blue-green deployments or canary releases, and you've probably heard of feature flags. I just want to kind of put into context what this practice is and, and, and why we're doing this. I used to list these goals down the left side here, these benefits as the reasons why we are doing this. We want to be able to avoid downtime. We want to be able to limit the blast rate if some things do go wrong. We want to be able to, to, uh, to promote the, the flow. So limit work in progress and, and achieve flow. How do I push lots of stuff through more often? And we want to be able to learn during the process. And what I explain in, that, in the blog post for this, which you can see afterwards, and in, in the videos for this, is that each of these technologies handles some of these things better than others. Um, uh, you know, blue-green is a really straightforward way of avoiding downtime because you can stand up the next environment completely separate from the current one, and only when it's totally ready do you switch over. When I was at BlazeMeter, we basically did a mashup of blue-green and canary, which is that we would build the new environment on a few containers. We would start to send a little bit of our traffic through it. We'd see how it was going, and if it went fine, we'd propagate to the rest, and we'd cut over, right? Um, and you know, feature flags changed this a lot because it wasn't about containers anymore, and it wasn't about large chunks of your release. It could be all the way down to a code block. It could be a specific block in your code that could be turned on and off a user at a time, right? Or a population at a time, right? And then when people started linking uh, real-time data analysis to the deployment of these feature flags, that's what really changed the ability to increase the psychological safety and to have that real-time feedback. So, um, let's go ahead and just quickly drill into feature flags to make sure everybody's on the same page on what that is. Uh, feature flag is not something you, you flip at build time. It's, it's not something you do when you launch a service. A feature flag is a, a, uh, an if-and statement in the middle of your code that is executed, that is evaluated in production in real time, a user in a session at a time. And it can be kind of thought of like a dimmer switch for changes, right? And that first row there shows that you've you're exposing this feature to 0% of your users. And some people will say, well, why would I take a feature into production and show it to 0% of my users? And there's a couple of reasons. One of them is it's not finished yet, and you're doing trunk-based development. The other one is that you want to test it in production without affecting any actual users, right? And then you would ramp it up from there. So that's more of a kind of a high-level discussion. Let's look at what it actually an example of feature flag is code, right? And I'll start with a really simple one. You're basically making a function call to some system that knows the state of the flag. Um, and in this case, you know, the flag is called related posts. And you're asking, hey, if, it, if this is turned on, then we'll show them related posts. If it's not, we'll skip it, right? And in a, in a multivariate example, we're saying, hey, which search algorithms should I be using for this user in this session? And we might be comparing two alternatives to our legacy search engine uh, internally. It's like a back end thing. And you know, give them v1, give them v2 of these new experiments, or show them the, the legacy, right? So that function call is going to a subsystem which can be updated in real time, separate from doing a code deployment. And if you know those things which we discussed, you've pretty much got the, the essence of what makes feature flags what they are, is that without doing a new, new deployment, without pushing a new config file, without doing any change to the actual what's deployed in production, you can change the behavior based on updating the rules those flags are evaluated by. So remember, we're going to talk about building up a layered approach to progressive delivery. And, and so feature flags, really, at the, uh, the, the, the most important thing they do foundationally is they decouple deploy from release. And what you get from that 
is being able to do things like incremental feature development for Flow. Uh, I'm sure Dave Farley has talked about this sort of thing before too, which is like, if, you, if you've got a lot of work to do, you don't do it all in the background and then suddenly try to take it live at once. It's much safer to, to put parts of it a bit at a time out into production. Even if the users aren't seeing it yet, you basically build it, integrate it, test it, move on to the next thing, right? And so incremental feature development is this notion of actually building up your feature a little bit at a time, and you may not be exposing any of it to the user yet, or you might be. But the point is that it actually lets you break bigger projects into smaller ones to get them all the way to production. Um, that leads to this, testing in production. Testing in production isn't I only test in production. Testing in production is I want to be able to validate. I want to be able to go as quickly as possible from committing my, my source to building it, to testing it behind the scenes, to maybe doing whatever smoke test you've got to do, but get it all the way out to production and be able to validate it in production even before users are able to see it. And finally, to be able to have a kill switch. So this is really the big, the first sort of quality of life thing for development teams, which is if you have pushed a feature out, you thought it was good, you tested it, it was all good, but when you get it out to production, something goes wrong that was unforeseen, and most of us have been through that dance, um, how cool is it to have a, a kill switch where you can just immediately turn that feature off without a rollback, without a hot fix? Because if you've been through you know, emergency hot fixes, half the time you're creating another bug when you're fixing the one you're trying to squash, right? So we've now laid the foundation. And I want to kind of switch gears now, because remember, the essence of my talk is, well, what's this layered approach to progressive delivery? What is that all about? So the upper layers are about data-driven feedback and automating that, that data-driven feedback. And we ought to ask, you know, why should we automate data-driven feedback? What do we get from that? And what we get is a different way to ship and a different way, sort of, I meant, reason I mentioned sort of quality of life here is that, is that the level of, so, uh, th th it's been proven that when you have greater psychological safety, people actually do move faster and they take bolder risks as long as they have that safety. And so let's look at this. So this is the way you can ship if you use this approach. Deploying pushes the code out, but it doesn't add any exposure to the users. It's, it's deployed, it's in place, but it's not being executed. Then you can, um, you can do error mitigation. In the case of error mitigation, you're trying to make one last pass to figure out, did I miss anything uh, when I built this code and I tested it that now shows up in production? And the reason it's zero to 50% ramp in this case is at 0%, I'm doing, I'm just using the dev and the test team and whoever else I've got to, to give it a, 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 to check it out in production before I expose it to users. And then I'm gonna gradually ramp it up, maybe even just a one or 2% of the population. Depends on how big your user population is, whether you can really get, get meaningful data with only one or 2%, right? And our goal here is to identify bugs and crashes we otherwise missed long before we exposed most of our users to the issues, right? Now, if that goes well, we wanna ramp up further. And this next step actually, even though it's in the middle of this, this is kind of an advanced practice, which is if I wanna be able to measure the impact of my code on the user behavior, um, I need to get a lot of users going through it, but I need, to, I need to have a holdback of a significant number that aren't going through it so that I can compare them. And statistically, the most powerful way to do this is to have half of them going through it and half of them not and compare the system performance and the user behavior between those two, right? And then finally, before I ramp all the way up, I'm probably gonna wanna stop somewhere between 50 and 70, 80% and make sure that the new code doesn't have implications for scale. And I don't just wanna stop for 10 minutes there. I actually wanna to try to overlap that with a peak period. So if I can go through a peak traffic period and have it at say 80% and see what the performance implications are, that's a safer way to go than deploying it completely and kind of crossing your fingers as you go through the next peak period. And finally, we release. So we've decoupled deploy from release, but we're also doing some very important data-driven uh, practices in the middle, right? So uh, it turns out that, that, that uh, you can't necessarily, when you're deploying out to a small population, you can't necessarily just push the change and look for changes in your graphs because the graphs you have are probably global even if they're at a container level, the reality is that you're not able to as easily discern at those low percentages of deployment, or sorry, of release, what's happening to people, right? And so you can't necessarily just make changes and watch. The problem got to solve is how do I separate signal from noise? There's other things going on while I'm doing this work, and there's also a lot of users going through the rest of the system. So how do I actually find a way to separate other changes in the product that might be influencing the metrics that I'm looking at. 
or marketing campaigns are being run or a global pandemic that's influencing how people are behaving. Or finally, just something as simple as nice weather, right? Nice weather can affect different kinds of, of, of user populations, right? So the answer to this um, is that we need to be able to cancel out the inference of the external influence with a stats engine. And this is something that's been done for years, but not necessarily applied to standard you know, continuous delivery. Think about noise canceling headphones, but for your metrics. Noise canceling headphones listen to what's going on in the ambient world. They know what's coming through as the signal and they counteract the ambient noise so that it's easier to hear the signal, right? You can do the same thing with metrics. So you've got your user population and you're splitting Half of them are going to get an experience and half of them are not, for instance. And in science terms, you'd call that the control and the treatment, right? The status quo is control, treatment is the new thing. And then you compare the distribution of what happens to each of those populations. And if there's a difference between those distributions, then you've got an actual difference. Um, uh, this is how you are able to, uh, in a very complex situation, be able to get a clear signal from a small change. So what do we do with that information? And here's where we go with the layers, right? So the first thing is to achieve safety. We want, there's something called a guardrail. And if you think about a guardrail on a road, a guardrail is along the side of the road. And it's there that if you get a little off track with your car, you get a little sleepy or something, you'll hit that guardrail and it'll bounce you back onto the road. You don't crash your car, you don't destroy your car. You might scratch it a little bit, but you don't fall off a cliff, right? And that's what a guardrail is for. So guardrails and do no harm metrics are how do I actually all the time have a protection of being of watching for the stuff that I know is important to me, but I don't have to put psychological energy into going and looking for it, right? So we want to be able to alert on exception. We don't want to have to go looking for problems. We want the problems to come to us, right? And we want to find those, especially on performance issues, early in our rollout. And we want to be able to limit the blast radius without manual heroics. So Yes, you could limit the blast radius by deploying to five or 10% and then frantically looking around at all the metrics you can find and looking through the logs and trying to figure out what, if anything's going wrong. That I call manual heroics. Much better, and this is, you know, David probably get into this in his talk maybe, that the, point of the whole point of continuous delivery is I want to automate as much of this as possible so it just gets done um, at any cadence, right? So that's automating guardrails and do no harm metrics. And again, it makes it safer for us to proceed and easier for us to catch things before they hurt a lot of people. So the next step kind of going up this layer is measuring release impact, right? I want to actually be able to see, did the thing I, I changed actually do what I intended? If we released a feature to accomplish something, did that actually happen? So think about this. Nobody really wants to be on a hamster wheel running, just iterating like crazy and build the next release, build the next release, build the next release without it having any impact on the business or the users, right? That's, you know, that's been called a feature factory where you're just cranking stuff out and it's, it's not fun and it's just kind of, it's just labor and it's not for any real meaning. Um, when we have direct evidence of our efforts, it's more likely to lead to pride of ownership. It's more likely to, 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 to lead in, you know, you're high-fiving not because you successfully did a release and, there, and it didn't blow up. You're high-fiving because you did a release and it moved something of, of importance, right? So this is measuring release impact. And then finally, really the kind of the icing on the cake here, and this is getting to kind of even a more advanced level of using this is something that, that many engineers would say, oh, this is a growth hacking thing or something, this isn't really my, my deal, but, but being able to test to learn or A-B test lets you take bigger risks more safely. So, so um, I'm aware of a company that, that, that does a food delivery service and they wanted to enhance their signup process to ask more about the user so they could better customize the experience. But there were a lot of people who were saying, wait, if we add more steps to the signup, more people will fall off and we'll, we won't get as many signups. So what they did was they ran an experiment where for some of the users who were signing up, they took them through the larger questionnaire and for others, they took them through what was the status quo and they let that run for a while. And what they're able to observe is that on average, those people that went through the longer, first of all, a lot of them, they didn't all drop off. They didn't have a significant drop off. And those that came through uh, consistently purchased more, their shopping carts were of a larger dollar volume um, than the ones who had gone through the shorter workflow. And so they decided, yep, we'll give it to everybody, right? So also want to talk about this. Sometimes people say, well, A-B testing, I don't want to build two versions of all my code and have to like maintain all that. That's crazy. It's not as simple as like, oh, I have to build parallel versions. There's ways to learn faster with less investment. One of those ways is using something called dynamic config. And that is that 
when you put a feature flag in place, it doesn't just have to be an on-off switch. It can actually carry with it um, additional data about how this feature should behave. Think about search results. You, you're not sure whether offering a user five options or three options is more likely to lead to overwhelm or more engagement. Well, you could actually use dynamic config to change those numbers without actually pushing a new version of the code. Um, and there's more complex things you could do. You could change, you know, there's companies that actually use this to change alert messages during the, the pandemic without having to do a new uh, release or have somebody mess with something in the database. Another example is painted door. So a painted door is when you add a new feature only really in name. You sort of put the front end to a feature there. It says, you know, there's a, on a screen you add some new thing like uh, enroll in, you know, automatic updates. And somebody clicks that, you say, oh, hey, thanks for clicking. Um, we're working on this feature. We're so glad to know you're interested. What a painted door is is literally just the door to a feature to gauge interest, right? So think about how, how little code has to be built. Instead of building out an MVP of the feature, you're literally just building um, a, a, a painted door to see if there's interest, right? So this is this, this pyramid we're showing is, is the reason we do progressive delivery um, can kind of go up to higher value reasons as you go. But absolutely, you start by decoupling deploy from release, and then you immediately work on automating your guardrails and your do no harm. From there, you're going to want to build a measure impact, right? So this is kind of how it layers up. So my, my POV, my point of view is that this is what sustainable software delivery looks like. I, I've spent most of my career focused on how do we make delivery more sustainable? How do we make it more humane? How do we make it more meaningful? Right? And I believe that this is exactly what it looks like. I, I, I push stuff out. I have an easy way to make sure that, that I haven't missed anything in production. I don't hurt my users when something goes wrong. At least not very many of them are for very long. And I know what the impact of my code is. And I don't get ugly surprises when I go through peak periods. Right? And if I need to, I can stop it with a push of a button. So um, this is the one slide where I want to just some people are kind of wondering, well, what, why am I here? What is split? Uh, this borders on sort of being an ad, but it's not really an ad. Um, but I'll admit that this, this, is a, this is kind of explains why, why we exist, right? So, so in-house progressive delivery platforms have actually been evolving for a while, and they paved the way for split. And the reason they did that is that they proved the value of layering up, but, but those who layered up had to put in huge investments. So the number of companies that actually have stats engines that automatically calculate what's going on all the time, and the number of, of, of teams that actually have um, automated, uh, uh, truly stats-driven automated alerting um, is really a small subset. And so when, when it became clear that this was a value, some of the people that left these companies on the right were frustrated when they go to other startups and they couldn't actually have that same functionality. And so they pitched the idea of creating Split, and that's what Split is. So we are a company that, that builds a platform that makes this possible without you having to build it from scratch. So that is what I wanted to share. Um, and I also, uh, as we jump into the Q&A, um, if you would like uh, either a, a t-shirt or some socks for some free swag, feel free to send an email off to swag at split.io and let them know. Let them know you're coming from the London Microservices uh, 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 meetup. Uh, and uh, they'd be happy to send you one or the other. So I hope that I've uh, opened your eyes to some kind of different ways. And you know, if we look at, at this, different ways we can make use of progressive delivery to make our quality of life and the impact of what we do better. Uh, and I look forward to having a little conversation about this. So how do we switch gears here now, guys? Hello. Hi. Thank you, Dave. Um, is there... Are there any questions? Um, I don't see any in the comments for now. It usually takes some seconds slash minutes before people come up with questions. Well, I would, I would so a couple of things. I would chime in. I agree with the pity about the lack of beers. I do miss uh, uh, pizza and beer at these things. And one other thing I would just say is that there's an awful lot going on in the world right now. and. Um, Kind of a little bit off topic, but I would say uh, if there's anybody in your personal world you can spend more time being present to, listening to, and and uh, 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 giving uh, their your time to, it's a really good time to just slow down and 
be there for somebody and listen. Uh, um, I, I think that there's kind of a lot of craziness going on right now. And uh, I found it challenging to prepare for this presentation, to be honest with you. Um, but uh, uh, I, I found time here and there between doom scrolling on Twitter. Um, and I hope that, that this is a, you know, I've tried to kind of package this in a way that's approachable for a wider audience, uh, which is kind of what I'm ever doing. Um, uh, and I know there's not like deep technical content here, um, but if there's interest in deeper technical content, um, I can hook you guys up with that kind of thing. So um, I, uh, I hope that was useful and uh, I look forward to any feedback you guys wanna give and I'll be sharing a link to the slides um, after Mr. Farley finishes his conversation, because uh, 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 I, I want us all to have a chance to check out what he's bringing today. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Dave. I have a question, actually. Um, like, I think some of these tools can work very well when. Uh, especially when you have a B2C application and you have a lot of consumers, um, mm. then 1% you know, of that can give you a lot of insight into whether you should be doing that thing or not do that thing or change this with that. Are these tools still useful in a B2B kind of context where you maybe have, I don't know, 50, 100 different customers using the application? So that's a, that's a great question. And frankly, at Split, we're more in that category than we are. We're not a B2C, right? So, yeah. so we, we face this ourselves, right? Which is we don't have 5 million users such that we could slice off 500,000 and see how things go, right? Uh, um, the, the, uh, when it comes to using statistics, obviously numbers help, volume helps for sure. Um, people will use the subsets of these tools though to do things like deploy to a specific client first and make sure that they're deploying the same experience to every user at that client um, while they're still conducting other, they're doing other things somewhere else. So the same sort of progressive delivery techniques of being able to target and observe still apply. Whether you can take advantage of the sort of separating signal from noise and finding statistical uh, significance is obviously much harder at the lower volumes. So I would say the sort of Lower layers of the pyramid still make a lot of sense. And even that first layer, which is the, the uh, guardrails, um, is still going to work. Um, you might have to play with sensitivity if you're literally only adding 100 users to something um, and you've got another 900 on the other side. You know, you can get some differences, right? But it's a fair question. Generally, the B to uh, B to B teams that are doing this are the ones that are in super high volume, places like, you know, Salesforce or, or um, you know, I guess you, uh, is, is LinkedIn B2B or B2C? Like, uh, they're sort of, right, they're kind of a strange beast that way, right? But, um, but uh, the sort of B2E, B2, business to employee or whatever. But yeah, that's a great question. It, it is the, the ability to do the stuff further up the pyramid gets harder and harder unless you have volume. That makes sense. Thank you. Any more questions? Um, I have got a question. Yeah. Uh, okay. Right. So, um, yeah, at my place of work, we are kind of we're looking at how to get off the kind of develop, release, production kind of um, release candidate schedule. Um, we yep. do feature flags. We, we are like we do fit kind of the mold of that previous question as well. We don't have a huge user base, but I'd be interested to know like where where you think we could make the biggest wins most quickly. Because um, I think kind of implementing the whole this whole strategy obviously is going quite a long way. Um, right, where the biggest wins come from. Yeah, I mean, I deliberately built the pyramid the way I did because I do think the biggest win is. Well, it's really, it's the first two layers that are on there, you know, the, the, the guardrails and the impact measurement. Um, some people, are, there's a lot of pros and cons of whether you're gonna do like A-B testing. But I would say, first of all, um, if you Google uh, uh, killing the release night or on a quest to kill the release night or whatever, you'll find a graph that shows how people ha have 
who, who use this approach, at least in our, our customer base, are making their changes during business hours. They're doing it Monday through Friday during business hours, and they take a break for lunch. I mean, it's, it's pretty cool. So, so at any scale, the ability to actually make taking something live less dramatic and less spooky um, and do it as kind of a regular course of business um, is, is, is available to everybody. Like, you don't need volume to do that. And we, you know, again, we're not huge, but we do percentage rollouts of changes to make sure things are okay, right? Um, um, so if you, if you uh, check out that uh, an, on a quest, I think it's on a quest to kill release night, something that was our CTO wrote an article. Um, but I would say, uh, to get yourself to the point where, like, let me ask, are you doing those changes after hours now? Are you doing, are you trying to do them in low volume periods? When are you actually taking those flags live? Um, so, yeah, so I think one, what we're trying to move away from at the moment is that we have flags for multiple features, but we push everything as a release candidate weekly. So we, we want to get that broken up and be doing more individual kind of feature-based deployment. Yes, right, right. So you're still batching them up. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Another thing, and I, and I thanks uh, Mr. Farley for putting on the, uh, the strategies thing. I would say another thing to Google would be um, continuous delivery in the wild, which uh, one of Mr. Farley's former colleagues, I believe, I don't know if, did you, I don't know if Dave, have you ever worked with uh, Pete Hodgson? Uh, um, but uh, Pete Hodgson wrote a book where he interviewed a bunch of teams of different scale and different environments that were using these approaches, using continuous delivery. And one of the key things is you do want to get to the point where you're pushing very small packages across the assembly line on a frequent basis rather than bunching them up. Because when you bunch them up, you're still doing a big bang. Even if there are lots of small changes, if you're holding them up and doing a weekly thing, you're still building something that's hard to inspect and something that's hard to react to, and hard to hard to understand the implications of. So you actually want to be able to. Um, uh, and if you look, if you kind of like, I don't know if it would work if you Google. I made a short video on on this too uh, on continuous delivery. But there was a million videos of continuous delivery, but. But the key is get yourself to a cadence where you actually find the way to push small boxes across the assembly line more often. And I guess it sounds like you already are intending to do that, but you haven't necessarily figured out how to get started. Um, how do you make that leap from the release candidate to the, the, and the thing is, I guess a lot of it has to do about decoupling too. You, you actually, the features have to be decoupled from each other. Because if you're, if, if the reason you're doing a release candidate is because you've got 12 things that all depend on each other that have to go live at the same time, that's not going to lead you to uh, small piece uh, delivery, right? Um, and if I go here, I, I, like actually, the reason why I can't. Uh, let me see if I can find this here. Uh, There we go. So I made a quick video on, on this and it actually um, uh, does get into, let me see if I can get this, share this link. Yeah, so that video I just shared in the chat is a, just a short video on continuous delivery. Um, and and I, I, I kind of tease some of the graphics out of, out of, uh, out of the book um, that, uh, uh, the continuous delivery in the wild book. Um, and that continuous delivery in the wild book is either available, you know, within the O'Reilly library just by clicking or, you know, to get it from split, you'd have to give your contact details. It's one of those sort of marketing driven ebook kind of things, but, um, you can watch that video without giving me your deets. I don't really care. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Well, thanks for that. Dave. That's great. Uh, there is one in the channel. Uh, I'm going to read it out. Uh, do you think these principles are applicable for config or low or no code style development scenarios, i.e., not just custom development, but applicable for low code platforms like Salesforce? Yeah, um, I've gotten that question before. Uh, ironically, last time I got that question was from a guy at Salesforce. Uh, uh, um, the answer is they they are um, actually the 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 overall paradigm, which is that I'm going to put a remotely configurable switch in the code that I can mess with whenever I want to without pushing new code, applies whether it's low code or, or whether it's a full you know, 
frankly, whether it was assembly. Um, uh, um, how, how you, where you put them and what you do with them is a little bit more of a fine art. Um, but the idea is that you could very easily, and there's companies that are already doing this for entitlement. They're, they're in these low code uh, or configured environments and they'll have, a, they'll have a, a, an environmental variable or something that determines whether a particular user has access to a feature or whether that feature is currently available, right? So just think that same idea. Um, and then in terms of the telemetry aspect of this, um, um, as long as you have a stream of data that, it, that includes which user had the experience or took the action, um, it's very easy to actually correlate that with the state of their flag at the time, and that's how you get the, the intelligence. That's how you actually, that's how you do the, the um, statistical correlation and, and causation, because you can say this user had this state and had this happen. That's kind of going beyond the detail we have for tonight, but but uh, uh, but yeah, the answer is yes. And if you want to follow up, I'm you can. Uh, I meant to. I think on my last slide, I had my LinkedIn uh, contact. But you, you guys are welcome to do connect if you want to actually get more scoop on that sort of thing. Let me grab that really quick. Um, anyway, I think we're. Uh, uh, Pretty close to the end of our time, and I will put. I'm just going to put the swag giveaway thing back up on the screen one more time, just before we go, in case somebody wants to grab that, or maybe I should have put it in the in the, in the chat. Um, um, actually, here. So. Um, I checked and I said, "Hey, can I send this stuff to the UK? You know, do you guys mind?" And they said, "No, that's fine. So uh, uh, it's cheaper than flying me to the UK. Although I miss it. I, I do miss. Uh, last time I was in London, I was another avatar in a virtual room, unfortunately. Um, but uh, we'll get together and have a beer at some point. 